very famous wine from Margaret Valley, uh, uh, um, Margaret River, uh, called uh, Pinot Blanc and Pinot Noir. This is called Pinot Noir. <laughs> That was just a sound check. <laughs> The 
duty manager can be contacted by calling the phone number, uh, which is left by the phone in the reception, uh, or outside the office. This provision is for emergencies only, uh, and not for uh, retreat or maintenance related questions. And so there's uh, some words now about silence. Uh, this retreat will be held in silence, apart from the designated Q&A sessions. Uh, to support the practice of meditation. Silence includes all uh, verbal and uh, bodily communication, such as talking uh, and bodily gestures, especially uh, between, uh, between you and other retreaters. Uh, so you can uh, practice as if you were alone. Silence may be familiar to some people, and it may be new and strange for others. Uh, but before we enter silence, we would like to give some practical information now about how you will be supported and, uh, and how we can all support each other in this unique environment to ensure your experience is as rewarding as possible. And after this talk, uh, instructions for the retreat will be given by Ajahn Brahm. So, uh, on the topic of communication uh, as a support for being in silence, uh, you can contact Sue uh, by leaving a note, again, in the reception area, as mentioned, uh, or around meal times uh, for any important retreat-related inquiries. Sue will also be able to pass on any message to the centre managers, uh, the restaurant supervisor, or the maintenance manager, if need be. Uh, there will be opportunities to uh, ask questions to Ajahn Brahm, when indicated after talks, or by uh, anonymous notes for the evening Q&A session. There will be a basket, a notebook, and pens on the table in the Syndicate 1, which is the lounge area near Norfolk Hall. I think we probably all pass through Syndicate 1 uh, to get here from the tea area. So the daily schedule uh, and any important announcements will be uh, posted uh, on the wall near the dining room. Uh, and on the windows outside Syndicate 1. Uh, there will also be one group interview session each, starting from uh, day 3, Tuesday morning. Uh, the list will be posted on uh, windows, again outside Syndicate 1. If you have a concern about uh, any uh, retreatants, please contact Sue uh, or the teacher, is that right? Contact my general one or should we? Yeah, sure. Rather than uh, contacting the retreatant directly. Uh, next bit about phones and internet. For the duration of this retreat, we ask that you turn off mobile devices uh, and internet. Uh, this might feel a bit disconcerting for some of us, but uh, it offers a very rare opportunity to go inward and build up the bright, beautiful energy of the mind. Once you have switched off your mobile phones and tablets, if you haven't already, um, please be assured that you can contact Sue or reception if you need to pass on uh, any important message to friends or family, uh, and we will pass any message on to you um, should they contact us with any emergencies. You can give the Belsey Bridge telephone number to a key contact in case of emergencies if you haven't done so already. The uh, Belsey Bridge phone number is, uh, I don't know whether to read it out, but, um, uh, shall I? <laughs> this is a phone, this is a phone line. <coughs> we're going we're to put it by the reception. Uh, messages can be left uh, via voice mail uh, if the staff are not uh, there to, to answer. Uh, if anyone wishes to pass on this number to a key contact, uh, please ask Sue after this evening's session. Uh, switching phones off and refraining from the use of the internet really supports the retreat environment. Uh, so the request is that you finish any business tonight if needed and then switch off. And if it helps with uh, the restraint, you can uh, hand your devices in to the staff for safekeeping or to Sue who will hand it in to the staff. So thank you for uh, your cooperation with that. Uh, so now a little bit about uh, use of the facility, including the grounds. 
this is so that you can feel comfortable with what's uh, happening here and we can all relax uh, into the space. So this hall here, we use this hall exclusively for sitting meditation uh, in order to develop and preserve peace and stillness in the room. Uh, please refrain from uh, lying down unless you have uh, permission for health reasons. Uh, we have provided either one a basic a floor mat per person or a chair. Uh, for reasons of space, uh, we appreciate it if you can settle on either the use of a chair or a mat um, rather than keeping two spaces. Um, please keep your personal belongings uh, such as shawls, cushions or any clothing uh, on your chosen space. If there is an empty chair or cushion, you may of course use it from time to time then please move your things back to your primary space when you have finished. This ensures that there is plenty of room for everyone to rest their legs uh, when necessary. And if there's any difficulty with the seating arrangements, please contact Sue uh, to ask for assistance. Um, naturally, we ask that you do not bring mobile phones into the hall, and that where possible, can you refrain from using plastic bags uh, or drinking in the hall to help keep noise to a minimum. Uh, a little bit now about the other spaces in this facility, uh, for example, for uh, walking meditation. So we are blessed with three main halls for our exclusive use during this retreat. Uh, before the first sitting of the day, the wave knee room will be available for yoga or gentle exercise. After this, it will be used for group interviews or silent meditation. Okay. Okay. So uh, scratch that because the room for uh, group interviews is now going to be the ditching room, the room, not the way the room. Uh, so they're just next door to each other. Right. And the way the room is also available for meditation. Uh, the Suffolk Hall is our walking meditation room. Uh, please ensure you walk width ways across the shorter length of the room so that. More people can make use of the room at any one time. Uh, Belsic Bridge has extensive grounds which you may also use for walking meditation, for exercise, uh, or a secluded stroll. There is also a small forested area near uh, next door's children's playground. Uh, <laughs> please do not do slow walking meditation in the village or the wider countryside. As the, <laughs> the neighbours may think we are somewhat strange. <laughs> So this is the next bit about the dining room. Uh, meals will be served in the dining room. Please take all your meals there uh, for convenience of the centre staff. Uh, there will be a bell for breakfast at 7.15 and for lunch at 11.30pm. Uh, in this hall, uh, the Norfolk Hall, our main dining hall, and the walking meditation hall, which is the Suffolk Hall, um, please avoid entering the dining area at least half an hour before meals to give the staff uh, plenty of space to uh, set up the meal. And Ajahn Brahm and Ben Venerable Chandler will be taking their meals 10 minutes before the bell. Uh, we ask that everyone else uh, waits for the bell to ring. Uh, within the restaurant, there is a special diet area for those who have told us you have uh, food allergies and intolerances. Uh, please ask a member of staff if you require information on the ingredients uh, in the food served. Tea, coffee and other hot drinks are available in the dining <coughs> room. Uh, between meals, hot water flasks will be put out at 9.30am, 1.30pm and 3.30pm and for our main evening tea break at 6pm. Um, if the fridge is out of milk or soy milk, please contact Sue uh, or Debbie, the restaurant manager, and it will be rebuilt. Uh, there is also a shop with snack items and toiletries. Uh, interviews. Uh, optional group uh, interview sessions will take place in the, way, uh, in the ditching of room, thank you, near the dining area, starting on Tuesday, uh, the 11th of December. Uh, there will be one interview each uh, in a group of around 16 people. 
the lists will be posted on the windows outside Syndicate 1, uh, which is the lounge area near the main water hall. Uh, if you do not wish to attend the group interview, please cross your name off the list. So this is about the staff here and uh, the times that they're, they'll be around. The managers of Belsley Bridge are available every day after 2.30 p.m. and most days from 7 a.m. in the center office. The maintenance manager is available from 8 to 4, Monday to Friday. Debbie, the restaurant manager, is also around to help. However, we advise that to keep distraction to a minimum, uh, you contact Sue uh, with any concerns <laughs> and allow uh, her to approach the staff herself if necessary. For emergencies, a 24 hour a day emergency phone number is found in reception. Uh, the main three doors to the centre will be open as soon as staff work, uh, staff start work at 7am uh, and will be closed at 9.30pm. Uh, in case you find yourself outside when the doors are locked, the door code, there is a door code and it's uh, 3670. Your room key also has a blue fob attached to it which can be used to open the door located at the reception. So please keep this key with you at all times. So does that mean that uh, it only opens that one door one day? And that's uh, any time of the day after 9.30. Okay. Great. Oh, I hear them rattling there. So this is about uh, just uh, oops, saving energy and saving water. Uh, caring for ourselves and others includes being aware of our use of energy and resources. Uh, in the common bathroom areas, please uh, use the showers between 5.30 a.m. and 10 p.m. only. And uh, we ask everyone to please keep showers uh, short. Also, please remember to turn off all lights in your rooms and bathrooms. Uh, if you're the last person in the meditation hall uh, or the walking room at night, please uh, make sure that the light is off when you leave. Uh, just a few more points here. The venue has provided bedding and towels. Uh, and in the absence of English sunshine, there are three hair dryers that can be borrowed from the manager's office. Uh, please ensure that these are returned immediately after use so others can use them. Uh, this is about fire procedures. The emergency fire information sheets are on the back of all bedroom doors and in each main meeting room. Uh, we ask that you read them carefully and familiarize yourself with the nearest fire exit to you. Uh, in particular, please keep fire doors closed. Please note that the fire system is sensitive and can be activated by shower steam uh, if you have an ensuite bathroom uh, or by deodorant being sprayed near the smoke head and by steam and or smoke given off when using hair straighteners and or hair dryers. There's loads of ways to set off the fire alarm. <laughs> <the sanitary. laughs> if the fire alarm sounds, leave the building by the closest exit. Do not stop for belongings. Assemble quietly at the fire assembly point, which is in the car park outside the reception area, and stay outside until the duty manager advises that it is safe to re-enter the building. Ooh, last page. Okay, ethical guidelines. Ajahn Brahm will explain the ethical guidelines, which are undertakings to uh, to support a meditative atmosphere and allow this to be a safe space. For everyone. But when we all practice these guidelines together, it creates a beautiful space uh, in which we are taking care of our surroundings and each other with an attitude of respect and kindness. Uh, the last bit's about lifts to the station and taxi, so is there any kind of update on that? Uh, yeah, well, it's, it, uh, uh, I'll just read it first. Now you have just arrived, so it is helpful to put aside all thoughts of the future. Uh, lifts to the station and taxis will be dealt with at the end of the retreat in the closing discussion on the morning of the 16th of December. Okay, so uh, I think there was a request also this evening um, to, uh, to uh, perhaps make arrangements for, for leaving at the end uh, this evening. Um, does that include after this talk or after this yeah. session? Yeah. Okay, so uh, that. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah. 
Okay, so yeah. So I've actually already done this. Uh, so uh, um, if you go to the reception, um, there is a sheet of paper with uh, some telephone numbers of taxi companies. Um, so um, I don't know if there's an opportunity after this session for people to uh, mill around and get together or arrange to go back together. Or... Anyway, if there is, please do that. <laughs> And, uh, and use those telephone numbers to, to, to book their taxi for, for the final day. I think the idea with that is that uh, uh, it's really helpful for everybody, for all of us uh, practicing on this retreat. Uh, we know that uh, these arrangements have already been made in advance and that we can forget about it and just relax. Um, so, um, especially once that's done, please put all concerns aside and allow yourself to fully arrive and come into the present moment with your practice. So as of now, silence uh, has begun, and we uh, wish you a very beneficial, a restful, and a fun retreat. Uh, are there any questions right now before I hand over to Ajahn <laughs> Brahm? No questions. Very comprehensive opening talk. Okay, so I'll uh, hand over to Ajahn Good question. Yeah. More comments by the person who has been saying to uh, always keep your room key with you because the uh, golf closes any rooms that are open. So you might get lost out of the Should I say that a bit more? Yeah. Uh, that's, this is about our room keys. Um, even if uh, we should just go to the toilet or something uh, and if we leave the door open, as <laughs> Or unlocked. It's it's great. To, uh, in fact, it's necessary please, to keep, keep all our keys on us at all times uh, because these the staff at the centre, uh, if they're in there and the if they go in there to do some cleaning or something, they, they will lock it at the end of their, their cleaning. So uh, <laughs> so basically, everybody please keep their keys uh, on them. Yeah. Um, The hall open. Oh. Open all the time. The hall is this this hall and the, the other halls as well. I think are open 24 hours. Round of clock meditation. Possibility. Okay. Is there a way to run round rounds and do exercise on retreats? Uh, well, then, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, if, if for for running, um, uh, jogging. Eh? That sort of exercise, it might be good to do it outside of the, the grounds, just in the surrounding countryside, if that's possible. Yeah? Do you think the shelters might be like 5.30 and 10, I think you said, 10 p.m.? In the common areas. If you have an ensuite, then you can use it at any time, is that right?
there are different people going to sit at different times, unless we show everybody. I think most people will probably leave at the end of the session. We could also do that. Do you think, John? Oh, yeah. We could just turn it off after the sign and people want to stay in the green room. I think so, unless it's especially cold. And if it's especially cold or especially hot, I encourage you to use Buddhist climate control. <laughs> which is, you know what's coming. That when it's too hot, keep a cool head. And when it's too cold, keep a warm heart. So, we cannot please everybody. And some people, if it's too cold, they tend to sort of uh, get colds and flus. They feel very uncomfortable. And for some people, if it's too hot, they also get uncomfortable. So we try and find a middle way. Which is one of the reasons why, uh, except at the end of the day, in the early morning, um, during the day, please don't uh, go into the room and turn on the heaters. And then somebody else goes one minute later to turn on the heaters. And then somebody goes in one minute later to turn them off again. Because if everybody has their preferences, which they do, then there's this chaos. So it's good that, uh, where's she going to get Anna? That she's, that she's maybe in charge of the heaters. So we have to leave it for you. So I to turn on the heaters or turn them off, depending on how you feel and uh, the energy of the, the room is. If it's too hot, please understand that you can always uh, meditate uh, over in your rooms, in the other halls, there's many places where you can meditate, it doesn't have to be in here. So it's too hot for you, maybe somewhere else, too cold, or somewhere else. It must be, it's a bit warm here. Yeah? <laughs> so I'm going to go and meditate somewhere else. <laughs> So, um, first of all, those of you who have uh, come to your first retreats, uh, please, we do have rules and regulations and uh, things to try and keep us a very peaceful, calm retreat. But this is not a concentration camp. If you break any of those rules, you will not be hauled aside and put in the dungeon rooms 
that is the most important role in any uh, Buddhist retreat or Buddhist monastery is kindness, is compassion, is forgiveness. So first of all, if you see somebody speaking, don't go and tell them, stop it! <coughs> you talk! And then someone else will say, so have you. And that's three people who broke the rules. But I know uh, in England there's a one very wonderful way of bringing people's attention to the fact that they've broken the noble silence. And that is to give them the one finger sign. You know the one finger sign? Not the middle one, this one, yes. Just to remind a person. So that means that you don't have to talk. And even though not talking to one another is important, and if they do forget, don't scold them, because we have kindness and forgiveness, very important part. Just the one thing at a time is good enough. But there's also, when people run retreats, sometimes it gets a little bit um, <laughs> cold. Uh, when we live together and we can't speak to one another. But part of noble silence doesn't mean you always have to frown. You can always smile at one another. And sometimes a little smile is all that's needed for actually to show a sense of mutual respect and harmony and the fact that you are here together uh, enjoying you know, this uh, time of silence. So please make sure that kindness is the first of the rules of any retreat. Also, that we do have a schedule, but that schedule is not going to be enforced, which is one of the reasons why we don't have bells on retreats. Not in the ones which lead to actually peace and stillness and a sense of inner freedom. Because otherwise, out there in that world, you have so many deadlines to meet. You wake up in the morning to your alarm. You have to hurry to get dressed or to meet a train or to get here, get there. And that causes a lot of stress. So instead, you can get up whatever time you think is appropriate. You can go to bed any time you feel you need to. Otherwise, you'll find, especially the first few days of a retreat, that you feel so tight, so tense. And in fact, it brings me up to my first story of the gentleman who went to see his psychiatrist, where he told his psychiatrist that sometimes I am sure, it's actually true, that I am uh, a marquee. And other times, other times I imagine, I'm sure of this too, that I'm a, a teepee. And the psychologist said, I've never heard that before. Sometimes you feel the old marquee, and another time you feel you're a teepee. And then the psychiatrist, ah, yeah, I got it. You're too tense. <laughs> and the fact you're not laughing shows that you are too tense. <laughs> Light it <enough>. up. <laughs> this is not an interview for a job. This is not a trial for murder in the old baby. Because you'll find that being too tense, being so tight, there's no way the body can relax and the mind can relax. Which is, I'll be explaining how important that is. So even though sometimes people ask, being a Buddhist monk is my 45th year as a monk, are you not sort of so tense and so afraid having to keep all of these rules of being so mindful of making a mistake? And the point is, absolutely not. You relax into these rules. And in fact, all these rules 
They're not really rules, but they're just they're not doing stuff. They're not speaking because why do you want to speak? We speak too much in, in life. It's one of the poems which is in uh, the first page of the first book which I ever wrote. Grant yourself a moment of peace. Grant yourself. Give it to yourself as a gift. And you realise how, how foolishly you scurried about. I think it's pointlessly you scurried about. Well, running this way and running that way. Was it really necessary? And you give yourself moments of peace. You find that you didn't need to do so much. <coughs> learn to be silent, which we're doing on this retreat. We learn silence. And we figure out we've talked too much. We do talk so much. In those retreats which I have given over the years, you do find that at first, for those people who haven't done a retreat like this before, it feels it's so tight. Why, do, why can't I just talk and just say hello to somebody? So usually what happens at the end of the retreat, we allow people to speak, and just to say hello to one another. And most people don't want to, because they enjoy the silence so much, they get used to it, they're not afraid of it, they don't fight it. And they tend to embrace that silence to start to love it. Why do we need to speak? And the next thing is that um, be kind, compassionate, and you realize your judgment of others and yourself was too severe. So be kind to one another. Be gentle, have a beautiful attitude of you know, an open heart. If somebody makes a sound, that's them. And then they do it for some reason, I don't know why. So, you know, this is not trying to figure out who are making the mistakes. And if somebody sees things different than you, don't judge them. Which means that if a person just does something which is, you know, against the rules which we have just explained, oh, I don't know why they do that, maybe they need to. So in this way, we're taking away something which is called fear. We cannot meditate and have deep meditation because you have fear. Fear is what causes control, and control is causes tension. And tension never allows the body or the mind to relax enough to get into deep meditation. Number two, the reason why we don't have balance. I often just say that what would have happened if they had a bell in Bodh Gaya, next to the Bodhi tree, when the Buddha was trying to get light. He got up in the morning and would be a bell, gong, time to go to bed. Gong, time to get up. Gong. Time to do something else. And it's happened to me many times that you are just getting into a nice meditation. Really, really peaceful. You're just really starting to bliss out and then gong. It's not a good bell. Anyway. <laughs> and you were disturbed. And there's other times other times I was sitting there and either sleepy or aching and for some reason or another it was going on too long. And that teacher, that teacher, he hadn't rung the bell at all yet. And I was wondering, when's he going to ring the bell? And I mentioned this in one of the talks that I started thinking all of these, all of these tricks. We call them in Buddhism skillful means. By getting a, a little either uh, pea shooter or a little slingshot. And practicing, first of all, so my shot was accurate. And then when I wanted the bell to ring, I would <laughs> pong and hit it from a distance. <laughs> and then the teacher wouldn't know because he had his, uh, his she had her, head, her, her eyes closed and a gong, 
and before they figured out what was going on, bow, 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 and I'll be out. But why do you want to do that anyway? Because there are some times your meditation is going very peaceful, and you're getting very deep. Carry on. There are other times when it's not the right time to do long meditation, so get up and do some walking meditation. What you're going to find out is you're going to be mindful, aware of your body and your mind, and to see what it needs. To find out how to get this mind very, very peaceful. So, all of the rules which we have, we call them eight precepts, not to sort of uh, kill any living being intentionally. And sometimes people almost murder themselves when they're meditating. Thinking that, yes, I'm going to sit, I'm going to sit through the pain, I'm going to sit all night, I'm going to sit longer than anyone else ever. That is all coming from ego and the sense of self. You never get anywhere that way. Some anecdotal stories. There was a monk a long time ago, one of the first monks who came to the UK. And he read in the suttas that if you, in the time of the Buddha, the Buddha would sometimes sit outside in the cold weather. They called it the time of the snows. Although I'm not quite sure that never seen any snow in the Ganges Valley at any time of the year uh, in this century. But anyway, it was supposed to be very cold and so uh, the Buddha would just sit just with his three robes. It was fine. And so this one monk who was staying in Hampstead by himself decided to try to go out onto Hampstead Heath in the winter time, January, February, when it was snowy, and do the same. Just needed an act of willpower, just endurance. And meditated all night, just no shawls, no hats, no socks, just to be the tough monk. And then he spent the next week in hospital with pneumonia. Another of my friends, who's currently somewhere in England, but I will not tell you where, he decided to actually just sit all night. This was I was in Thailand, I was with him at the time. Sit all night, don't worry about the pain, without moving his body. And he managed to sit until dawn, at which time we had to take him to the hospital for a double knee replacement. All the times I have seen, I have found that the willpower is just coming from a sense of self, ego, and you will find it destroys the health of your body. So don't use effort, use kindness and wisdom. And understanding that, you would understand that why we have these precepts. You don't want to harm anybody. That includes yourself, your own body and mind. You're not going to sort of steal anything to take what is not given. We wait for what is given to us. What comes along? The natural process of meditation. You don't go grasping stages of meditation. We don't go running after even stages of enlightenment. We don't steal them. We wait until they come to us. The food you have in the, the refectory, in the, the dining room, it comes to you. It's a buffet. You take what you need. We don't go calling out the number for the pizza delivery. And so they, they deliver the pizza late at night when you're really hungry. Now you have the, um, the, the number to open the door outside. You don't need to... <laughs> I'm fed up with this. No, no food in the evening. <laughs> no one is going to check on you. But we trust one another. So, we have 
not taking what is no, not given to us on this retreat. And look, I've been keeping eight precepts for 40, over 44 years. <laughs> I'm okay. So it's not going to kill you. So, uh, please uh, keep the not taking what is not given. And there's also no sexuality. Which means we look at one another, not as sexual objects, but just as human beings. Which means we don't act provocatively, we don't wink provocatively. I can't do that anymore anyway. <laughs> no one would be interested anyway. So anyway, this is not just to, to get into sensory desires. It's to find a world which is not governed by how attractive you look, not judging you just by things which uh, bring other people close to you. We're just human beings traveling through this world and we're looking inside ourselves rather than looking at other people, keeping things really, really simple. And just for even the line, the fourth precept which we keep and that precept is being true to ourselves. It's very easy not to, to, uh, to keep that precept when we don't speak. But it's more than that. It's that, how are you now? Not how you should be, or how it's said in the book, but being truthful to uh, your, your sense of health and comfort right in this moment being true to how hungry you are and eating appropriately when you have your breakfast or lunch. It's being true. And one of the ways of achieving that, and most of these things I will be telling you afterwards uh, during the talks, to be true to yourself means to find out you know, what your body and mind needs. And very often I ask people, many times during the day, Ask your body, body, how do you feel? How are you? What do you need? Ask your mind, mind, how are you? What do you need? Because when you ask a question of your body, or you ask a question of your mind, you're actually uh, being mindful of the state of your mind. Asking a question pushes your attention onto that area where you can get an answer and your body of mind actually gives you very interesting answers. For example, some of you may get the answer, I'm tired. You've come a long way, some of you. I think I've come the furthest <laughs> from Australia. And I do still have some jet lag. It's disappearing. Some of you have come from, again, Eastern Europe, some of you forever. There are times when you'll be tired. Some of you will have, oh, the body does weird and strange things. There may be uh, some viruses going around, some diseases going around, and I should actually mention to you that I do have a contagious disease. It's, uh, it, was, it was diagnosed, I think, a year or two ago by one of my German disciples. And it's, it's called um, Happy Titus B. <laughs> Not hepatitis, Happy Titus. <laughs> and you already started catching it. <laughs> Be careful, inoculate yourself. <laughs> and be from Buddhism, Happy Titus Buddhism. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> Um, you do find that, some, this is my own experience over many years, that sometimes, I don't know why, I don't know why now, sometimes you feel tired. You know, you, you ask your body, ask your mind, you know, what's up? I said, I'm tired. We just had a sleep. I am tired. But there's no reason. Actually, I'm wrong, my body says, I am tired. And so we know what I do, I, I listen to my body, I take it to bed. 
any time of the day or night, if I feel like that, and I can, I just lay down. You know what happens? You, you, you have this incredible short sleep, you know, immediately you just um, become unconscious, <coughs> and then when you wake up, you feel so good. Then I usually either have a shower if it's the right time, or, or have a cup of tea or juice or whatever. And then I go and meditate. And I've taught that to so many people, they have their best meditations on a retreat. They're working with their body rather than trying to control it. If you try and control your body, your body's going to win. And it's going to sort of cause you all sorts of sicknesses and troubles. It's going to throw a tantrum. You work with your body, not against it. And so that always was being true to my body, being true to my mind. Being true to my mind. I'm not, I'm not restless. I'm not asleep. No, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just in, 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 in deep meditation. <laughs> I'm not sleepy. I'm not restless, I, I just have to think about things. You know. I'm the manager, I, I've got to think about things. No, you're restless. So be honest to yourself, and to your body, to your mind. And of course the intoxicants, which is the fifth precept. You know, it's weird, I'll mention more about this afterwards during the retreat. But some of the great happiness, and people sometimes mistake this for being high on drugs. In one of these uh, times I was visiting UK, that in one of the, the prisons here in UK, they managed, the Thai community and a few other people, they managed to get together a big Buddha statue which they'd installed in the prison grounds. Now, in order to have a place of peace, you know, for some of the people serving time in jail. And I remember just being here at the time, so being invited to participate in a blessing, opening ceremony for it. And there I was just walking around this Buddha statue inside one of Her Majesty's hotels. And there, I was getting so, so much joy, so much happiness, contemplating and how this will give some inspiration, some positive energy in places where there's very little positive energy at all. And as I was walking around with a big smile on my face, out of the corner of my eye, I saw two prisoners, two crims. They were looking at me, they were just waiting for the food which was going to come <laughs> later on seeing what was going on. And they looked at me and one said to the other, and I heard them, that monk, he's on the gear. <laughs> and apparently he's on the gear means, I'm not quite sure whether it meant marijuana or cocaine or ice or whatever, but it meant they thought I was on drugs. Simply because that's the only way they could relate to happiness like that. You don't need the drugs, or the, the alcohol, or anything else other than a peaceful mind, and it creates some happiness. So, in this retreat, do not be afraid of happiness. Sometimes people feel that they shouldn't be happy. And they get attached to happiness, and I'll mention this in length. Happiness is an important part of the path of the journey. So when it comes, let it be. You will get stronger and stronger and stronger. This is, believe it or not, a very happy path. An incredibly joyful path. More happiness than you could sometimes think you can handle. One thing I have discovered, personally and other people confirm it, there's no limit to the amount of happiness a human being can endure, as long as it's coming from the, the mental, from Chitta Sankaras. Beautiful happiness. Oh. 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 He does say that. 
but that's how you feel. So we don't need our common tracks. It's not that we think they're bad or wrong or rotten or who wants them? And of course we have the uh, not eating. Why don't we have anything to eat in the evening? And a lot of times it is because the, it's not really that necessary. If you don't see the food, no, you don't even think about it. And you find it so easy not to have to eat stuff in the afternoon. And just eating in the morning time, having some good food in the morning or even just before lunch, it's an old tradition. But it means in the afternoon or evening, you know, the blood is not going to your, to your um, uh, digestive system, it's actually going up to your, your head. In other words, you've got more energy. You don't feel so tired. You have an empty stomach, a free mind. And sometimes those afternoons and evenings where it's not devoted to eating, you'll find it devoted to something else, a beautiful piece of meditation. So even though we do have a tea time at a certain time, you don't have to go to the tea time. If you feel you've had enough energy input for the day, you can just uh, sit quietly and be peaceful. Sometimes you know, just the food is just a habit. In the evening we've got to do something. But out of kindness and compassion, I'm sure you've been told this, if you are sick, if you have uh, some uh, problem with your digestion or you're taking some medication <coughs> and your GP has told you you have to take the medication with you know, some of this and some of that with some food, you know, it's fine to actually to take, you know, say some uh, medication and get some, I don't know, some soy milk or an apple or an orange or something, whatever, a piece of bread. And this is, you know, with permission from the manager, that is no problem at all. As long as you, you don't make a five-course meal because you've got to take one tablet of antibiotics. <laughs> that is just an excuse. And it's also just um, uh, the next precept of, you know, we don't look at entertainment. Or, you know, use again, um, distracting clothing. So we're not trying to attract other people's attention. We're not trying to stand out and be different. We're just uh, being a normal human being. So we use clothing to keep warm and just to uh, make ourselves comfortable and no entertainment. And someone says, what about you, Ajahn Brahm? You make all these jokes. Is that entertainment? Anyone who hears my jokes long enough know that it cannot be called entertainment. <laughs> Even though once, I must admit, the truth is that when I was in Melbourne, this fellow came up afterwards and he said that my material was unique at that time. It was in very well good timing and he was a professional comedian and he, he offered me a job <laughs> in the Melbourne Comedy Club. He actually did. And in Australia, all great comedians are all started in the Melbourne Comedy Club. So I had a great intro, a big break, to make it in the comedy world. Well, I decided not, <laughs> obviously. But anyway, it's also good to just you know, uplift people, to make them laugh, to actually to give them some joy. As I heard from one Tibetan teacher a long time ago, that when you are laughing, you have your mouth open. And that's when you can throw in the pill and dumb. <laughs> And lastly, of course, we don't use luxurious furnishings. It's all in fact, it's okay to sleep on a bed. I know that some traditional Asian Buddhists, they think if you are going to keep the eight precept, you have to sleep on the floor. Here, in this retreat, I'm sleeping on a bed. This is an ordinary bed, it's not luxurious. I tried that a few times when I was teaching in a prison in, the, uh, in Australia. The only place which I could get to rest at night was in a, a Catholic parish house. And, you know, they had a bed rate. They were very kind, just because I was doing some good stuff. And, and so, um, I slept on the floor. When I arrived just after lunch, they offered me lunch, 
something to eat. I said, no, no, thanks. And then I sort of went out to the prison to teach the crimps. And when I came back, I was saving some dinner. I said, no, 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 don't need any dinner. You know, because my precepts. And in the morning, sort of, you know, they, they came to make sure I was all right and invited me down for breakfast and they saw I hadn't used the bed. I was sleeping on the floor. And then, these Buddhist monks are really weird. They don't eat, they don't sleep. <laughs> And they got all quite concerned. So after that, I slept on the bed to make them happy. <laughs> to make them distance. As long as it's not so luxurious. So we use these things for the right purposes to keep a healthy body. And how much do we sleep? Some nights you sleep a lot. Some nights you don't sleep hardly at all. Don't be afraid of not sleeping much. If you were at home, if you were, had to go to work, of course you'd be afraid. I've got to get up at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock in the morning to get to work. I've got to get a full night's sleep. If I don't get a full night's sleep, I won't be able to perform at work. Especially if you say you are, you are a doctor, a surgeon. Imagine. Oops. <laughs> oh, I never meant to cut that off. <laughs> so, please. Sometimes you don't need to have fear. If you get it wrong, you get up too early, you can always go back to bed again later on in the afternoon or the evening. You know, sometimes you don't want to get up. Sometimes you don't want to go to sleep. So check your body and your mind. How are you? So you may, 9.30 or whatever, we're supposed to finish off, uh, 8.30 or whatever, I don't know, uh, the, the talk and the and the uh, formal part finishes. If you feel really good, carry on. If you feel you're tired, go to bed. When you wake up, just get up. Don't even worry what time it is. You don't have to come for the chanting. You don't have to come for the morning sit. Just whatever you feel is appropriate for you, on this day at this time. That is using mindfulness and wisdom, just rather than being a Pavlovian dog, just getting up or being afraid because what other people might think of you. I am an uh, Anukampa uh, Bhikkhuni Project trustee, therefore I must get up. No, you don't. I am a Bhikkhuni. I have to get up in the morning. No, you don't. <laughs> have a break, you're working too hard. <laughs> if you feel like it, great, great. If you don't, don't feel good. Be sensitive to your body and mind. And that means that we just sleep the right amount. Now hopefully you're getting the, the picture here. And you find if you are mindful and kind to your body and to your mind, yes, you may sleep a lot for the first few days, but then you start to build up your energies. You have some great meditations. One of the stories, a lady came to one of my retreats from Sydney, came really late, she was an executive, she had you know, finished off all her work. This was actually a retreat I was giving in Sydney. Finished off all her work, 9, 10, 11 o'clock, finishing and just driving to the retreat centre. And just, well, I was in bed by the time she rocked up. So she went to her room and slept. And in the first morning, when I gave my first talk, she was a very intelligent lady, got it straight away. After my talk, she went to bed. She got up for lunch. After lunch, she went back to bed again. She got up for the evening talk, and after the evening talk, she didn't meditate anymore, she went back to bed. She only got up for, for the talk, for breakfast and lunch, and that was it. The rest of the time, <laughs> she was on her back sleeping. 
And she told me that sharing a room with about three other women, every time she was conscious, the other women looked at her and said, who do you think you are? You're not a real practitioner. We're getting up early. She said, they hated me. And I said, no, they don't hate you. They're jealous of you. <laughs> they wish they had the guts to do that. And I mentioned the story because after three or four days, she was exhausted being an exec. There was lots and lots of work to do. And then after three days, she started getting up at the same time as others. And she soon caught up with her meditation practice and after six days, she started to streak ahead. She was one of the star meditators on that retreat. I mentioned her because I praised her a lot. She came with sleep deficit from her work. She was so tense, naturally because of her work schedule. So she took the three days to be mindful and kind to her body. Because of that, after three or four days, she really had good energy. And then she took off in her meditation. For those of you who understand what is Ajahn Brahm talking about, aren't we supposed to strive, not against our body, but with our body? Even the Buddha, before he became enlightened, he was trying that striving for so many years, for six years as a Bodhisattva. Six years of hard effort until he gave up and wasn't getting him anywhere. And then he had the insight. All this striving wasn't leading him anywhere. And he recalled the, the time as a young boy, probably about seven or eight, when he was watching his father doing a ceremony doing a ritual. And as you all know, ceremonies and ritual is boring as hell, especially for kids. So he was sitting under a tree. First of all, it would be daydreaming until he let go and entered into what we call the first jhana. Years later, having exhausted all these other possibilities of getting some enlightenment and truth, he remembered that time. And it's in Majima 36, the Arya Parasana Center. And there he started to remember and thought, maybe that is a way to enlightenment, to Bodhi. And the word Bodhi meant awakening. From the Pali firm Bujati to wake up. Maybe that's away. So he gave it a try, but before he gave it a try he realized this is an important part of the Buddha's journey. That there's no way he can get into such deep meditation with such a tired, exhausted, weak body. So he began to look after his body. Enough sleep, wash, comfort, food, good food and then found a beautiful place to meditate next to a river under a cool tree in those days I was talking that I first went to Bodhgaya in 1974 there was hardly anybody there and that was not so long ago imagine 2,500 years and a bit ago he chose that place because it was so silent but next to a river, with cool breezes, under a beautiful tree, getting grass to sit on. It's not asceticism, it's called the middle way. So look after your body, and then you find it's easy to calm your mind. That's why you got enlightened. So in this retreat, it's not going to be forceful, it's not going to be tense. It's so not a Zen retreat where someone comes behind you with a stick. I once did that over in, what was that, in Fossil Hole? Yeah. Went there, what was that, 1970, yeah, 1972 or three or something. Went for a retreat there. You know, they made the most amazing custard. 
two, three things which I remember from that retreat. <laughs> custard was this. I've never had custard like that again. I don't know what century it is, but. <laughs> There's another little story there, but one of the stories was the first time getting up early on a Sunday morning. Very cold. You had to face the wall and hear the footsteps of the teacher coming behind you with the Zen stick. And I was really sleepy, but I'd always had some very lucky karma. The guy sitting next to me was more sleepy, so he got hit first. Wow! And I was not sleepy for the next two or three hours. Not because of a surge of energy, but because of sheer anxiety and fear I didn't know. But I don't know if you know them because I travel around a lot. Uh, in Hong Kong I was talking with a, a Chinese Mahayana master and he was saying that in one retreat over in, I think it was, um, actually I'm not quite sure, somewhere in mainland China, that they were having a retreat, a same retreat, and the master came along and saw this middle-aged woman. She was nodding, so he hit her with his end stick. And she got out her cell phone, her mobile phone, and called the police. <laughs> True, called the police, and the police came and arrested that teacher, that monk, and took him away. Now you know why we don't allow mobile phones. <laughs> <laughs> And that's not the way to meditate out of fear. So, one important thing which Ajahn Chah kept on telling us again and again and again and again and again and again and again. You meditate not to attain things. If you come here to attain a jhana, if you come here to attain some enlightenment, if you come here to attain some wisdom, you come here for the wrong purpose. We come here, we meditate to let go of things, not to get things. Shokyam Trungpa, for all his faults, he noticed a very important thing of Western Buddhism. He called it spiritual materialism. How many hours are you going to sit on this retreat? Are you going to beat your PB, your personal best. <laughs> How long can you meditate? 40 minutes? Nah, that's nothing. I did that last time. I'm going for 45. 45, let's do it now. Oh, that's nothing. I'm going to do first jhana, first jhana. Oh, that's nothing. I've got my first retreat. I'm going for second jhana this time. <laughs> second jhana? Uh, no, go for third. I'm going to go walking meditation. I'm going to see how slow I can go. <laughs> Staying up late at night. And I did this when I was a late person. Sometimes in a retreat, I say, I determined to be the last person outside the meditation room. So, you know, after we'd finished everything, I'd be meditating there. And after that, I'd, you know, here, all the people, I wasn't really inside in jhana or anything. I was just listening to other people as they left. Okay, they should all be gone by now. Oh my god, damn it. That person. Oh, can't they go? And then I suppose my eyes are coming down and then another ten minutes they were still there. And after the retreat, I said, Wow, well, why do you sit there for so long? They said I was waiting for you to go. <laughs> it's so dumb. So it's not spiritual materialism, it's just learning how to let go. Not to judge yourself by others, not even to judge yourself by any standard, just to be, to let go. And that's one of the reasons why we have these precepts, these rules. They're not there to give you more trouble. You have enough trouble as it is. They're there just to, to make it so that uh, you don't cause trouble to others. As best you can. You always will cause trouble to others. That's just the nature of human beings. But it means that there's a way that we can have kindness, lessen our trouble. And of course, because you can come in and go out whenever you need to, 
Please don't make a noise when you get up. When you walk out, when you open the door and close it. You don't need to. Burglars, thieves, they can go into a person's house and they don't even know the owners. And they can walk without making any sound. They can open doors without making bangs. If burglars can do that, surely you can. And always remember, so what are we here for? At the very least, you may be able to, to train for another profession. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard to find employment these days. I'm not talking about being a house thief. MI5. Do you think James Bond will make a very good meditator? <laughs> His precepts are a bit dodgy. <laughs> You know, I better drop my hand and go, what time am I supposed to finish? Mm. Oh, no, we've still got time. We had one monk uh, who, um, that's, that's why he ordained uh, with me over in Perth a long time ago. And when I asked him what he did, he was Nepalese, a Nepalese Buddhist. And I said, what did you do before me? And he says, I was in the Gurkhas, the British Army Gurkha. And he told me, in one of the Gurkha tales, he says, you never know when a Gurkha comes. The only time you know it was a Gurkha who attacked your, your balance or something is when you wake up in the morning and you shake your head and it falls off. <laughs> That's the sign that Gurkhas were there. <laughs> they were scary soldiers. And those good. <laughs> well, I was a bit concerned about you know just ordaining him. You know, if I if I told him joking, he didn't sort of you know understand it, or he didn't take he didn't take it too personally, or whatever. I thought, oh my goodness, maybe I wake up in the morning. So they had for him. But anyway, he was uh, he was in the accounts department. <laughs> that's that's all there was there. But anyway, just uh, uh, he could, or those soldiers, they were very, very good at being mindful. They could walk in and out of the hall without making any sound. That's part of the training. They can do that. You can. So don't go making noise, because otherwise, it's one of the reasons why people say, no, let's all start together at a certain time. And five o'clock, six o'clock, we start meditating, and then everybody sort of uh, finishes at a certain time. Then we come back again at a certain time. When we have a schedule like that. It does mean that all the disturbance and noise come at the same time. But surely we can do better than that. So if you do finish meditating, just get up very silently, so no one hears you coming. No one hears you. As best you possibly can. Now it will happen obviously that sometimes we have to make a noise. And sometimes that's say when we cough. Now there's one thing I've also known when people cough. It's better just to cough straight away. <coughs> Thank you. There's always someone has a cough out of sympathy because we have something in meditation called the volcano effect. The volcano effect works like this. A volcano, you know, it has all this magma underneath and it's, um, what's it called, the vent gets all blocked up, you know, with, with um, uh, cold solid rock, which used to be magma before. And the pressure builds and builds and builds until eventually the volcano blows there's this huge explosion and all these they're toxic gases as well as particles and stone, molten stuff, go flying over all the villages around. It's very, very dangerous. Sometimes people say, I'm not going to cough. 
you bottle it up, you stuff up your coughing vent. <laughs> and what happens? The pressure builds and builds and builds. You know it's going to blow, you think you can control it. The more you control it, the more the pressure builds and builds and builds until. <coughs> Everybody, even in Norwich, is a, that may be an exaggeration, but worse, all this really yucky stuff that flies like lava, like toxic gases over all the people around you. That is not a good idea. So please, if you need to stop something, thank you, there we go. It's nice to see people understand my instructions and actually follow them straight away. <laughs> So if you need to come, just come. And then it's actually much less of a distraction for people. So this is just learning how to still be with your body. And you know, maybe go back. Uh, don't try forcing the body, learn from the body. You learn from the body, you find the body and you working together towards peace and stillness. We don't try to attain things, these things happen naturally, as I was said, the time of this retreat. So, that's anything I've missed out for the beginnings? Okay, okay. So, we now have on the schedule a, um, a guided meditation. So, if it's guided meditation, you have to follow my instructions. So, first of all, please stand up. Okay, five minutes. Okay, yeah. Five minutes, and it's even better. Five minutes of going to the toilet or having a bit of a stretch. Silence. Silence means no talking, but you can cough. I've never seen this. I should take one of these, these lovely cartoons about a person, a monk, who was also a ventriloquist. So he kept no more silence, but his puppy didn't. <laughs> That's one way of breaking the rules. I didn't talk, I found it. But, hello, have a nice day. How are you today? <laughs> I never said that.